Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Barbara Frost. I'm the Chief Executive of WaterAid. Uh, sound check. Can you hear me up the back? Yeah. Fine. Excellent. Um, well, I'm delighted to be uh, opening this event this evening, um, which is bringing together practitioners, NGOs, academics, and a whole range of people from the world of media to talk about uh, these interlinkages between the issues of women, health, and sanitation. And it's been titled Making Connections um, because working together, working across sectors, is obviously critical if we're going to see women's empowerment, uh, women's rights, women's livelihoods, an end to violence, good health. And the particular three themes that uh, we're going to focus on this evening are violence against women and girls, reproductive and maternal health, and menstrual hygiene. All areas that have a degree, I'd say, of taboo around them, um, areas that need to be talked about, um, really need uh, practitioners to look at how we can address those, talk about them openly. Um, and I'm delighted that we're also going to be launching in the UK the uh, Menstrual Hygiene Management Manual, which was launched last year, but this is the sort of official launch of it here in the UK. Um, I was thinking about this when I was asked if I would open it up, and um, thinking about my own experiences, and I'm sure many of yours, when I visit uh, country programmes where WaterAid works, what I hear from the women and girls that we meet. And I was in um, Rwanda earlier this year, and I met this wonderful woman called Grace, youngster, teenager at school. And she was telling me about the transformation for her life uh, when there was safe water to drink close to the school because a uh, uh, water collection system had been put in with decent water and when um, toilets were brought to the school as well with decent facilities so that when she was menstruating she could change, she could wash. And she was saying that before that um, the threat to her health was having to collect water from an unsafe source um, some distance from her school which meant that she had to miss lessons. She often got sick as a result because the water was not clean. Um, and there was also competition for <coughs> collection of that water because there were many people at the source. And she was also saying how um, previously, you know, when it was the time of the month, she didn't come to school because there was just nowhere safe for her um, to change. So these issues are so real and they make such a difference um, for women. And so I'm delighted that we've got this wonderful panel um, that are going to comment on the speakers who are going to start off and to give us some, I think, insights into the research that's been done um, and then I'm sure to have a very lively debate. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I'll just talk us through um, the running order for tonight. Um, so I'm Therese from WaterAid, and I'll, I'll be presenting um, a little bit later on. Um, but we're starting off with uh, five presentations looking at the three themes um, and an opening presentation from Helen Pankhurst that really weaves those together so that we get to understand those connections from the start. But then we have um, some expert presentations um, from Laurie Heiss and Wendy Graham um, and then Rose George will be sharing some experiences and stories of menstrual hygiene and I'll be talking about the resource book that we're launching here tonight. I'll then be handing over to Rose George and she's going to uh, facilitate the panel uh, discussion and we'll invite some questions from the audience at that point. So during the presentations we won't have time for Q&A after each one so please do um, save up any issues that you want to raise for that final section. But without any further ado, we've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to hand over to Helen. Thanks. Good evening. Um, it's really an honour to be here and to be starting with this overview for the Share Consortium event on women's sanitation and health. And it's great to see so many of you here on a Monday evening giving up your time and, I assume, interested in the issues. So thank you for coming. Um, in her book, The Second Sex, Simone de Beauvoir wrote, or rather the translation of what she wrote was, 
Biological considerations are extremely important. In the history of a woman, they play a part in the first rank and constitute, whoa, an essential... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you up there. <laughs> and constitute an essential element in her situation. For the body being the instrument of our grasp upon the world, the world is bound to seem a very different thing when apprehended in one manner or another. And yet, despite knowing how important women's bodies are in their experiences, issues such as menstruation, women's reproductive and maternal health, and violence against women are sensitive and taboo subjects, as Barbara mentioned, not talked about and therefore not given the attention that they require. Now, I've been asked to set the scene a bit in terms of um, some of my personal experiences, and I'm very happy to do that. And they start, I guess, with some ethnographic work that I did in the late 80s as part of my PhD thesis in what turned out um, and was um, turned into a book called Gender, Development and Identity. And um, it starts really with the first time I visited uh, the village, which became my village, um, and uh, I talked to a young woman and she took me to her house and to her mother in the hut and her mother was in bed and um, the young girl said at the time, oh, she's got a headache and oh, she's got a headache was actually that she had really bad period pains and I heard about that later and firsthand saw all the difficulties <coughs> of managing menstruation when you have no pain relief, no, ta no tampons, no pads, often no pants, no uh, trousers. So incredibly difficult situations that women bear with day in, day out. And I wrote at the time, this is not the same kind of constraint as childbearing or other obvious and dramatic <coughs> female burdens. Yet it is in such seemingly insignificant ways that the economic poverty and the conditions of life are particularly wearying. The village had been recently villagized, and that meant that the government was trying to put people into uh, the valleys at the bottom, um, away from their, the hillocks and the hamlets that people used to live in. And now they used to live in those hamlets, smaller numbers, and they weren't latrines, but now they were being moved by the state into the valleys um, below and still no latrines. So I think there were about 80 households uh, living um, all together. Uh, the houses were built and no latrines. And I lived there for a year. So for a year I lived where there were no latrines and that meant learning to go to the toilet early in the morning and late at night. That meant um, defecating in the open when I had diarrhea, when I was not well, when I had my period. And without any doubt, that experience was the hardest of the year um, in Merns in Northern Shire, followed very closely by having rather limited water, and in particular limited water for warm water for showers. So that's a bit of a personal background as to, you know, imagining what life is like without um, basic facilities in terms of sanitation and hygiene. But actually I was there to study... Um, how women and young girls um, lived and it was the study was actually a relationship between the state and uh, the peasantry and the relationship between men and women and it was very it was looking into how the less powerful in those relationships were managing and one of the issues was uh, beyond that daily constraint or rather the monthly constraint of the periods was the fact that going to defecate or going to collect water was often the time when women and girls were exposed to violence uh, and abuse. Um, it could be at other times, such as going to the market or going to schools, but those two points, early and late in the day, were ones that where there was significant violence. And this was sometimes legitimised. So you have a culture where you had marriage by abduction. Marriage by abduction was sometimes planned, so a man might think, okay, I want that woman, and um, would abduct the young girl, rape her, and then it would be culturally legitimized through elders getting involved in the discussions, and this would form marriage. So you have a culturally legitimized way of um, <coughs> rape turning into marriage. Now, to 
paint a fuller picture, the reality was also that um, young girls and boys who wanted to get married where the parents were not, were against this relationship, would also pretend that this was a marriage by abduction and the girl would be going to collect water and would be uh, abducted. So it's a complicated story, but, but one in which the vulnerability of women and girls was considerable at that moment. Then there are issues around childbirth and poor hygiene and sanitation, which I witnessed at the time, made worse in Ethiopia and in many other countries by things such as FGM and fistula problems. So again, culture, politics, society, making women's bodies and the dangers around women's bodies that much more dangerous. And um, I could go on endlessly uh, about my research project 30 years ago, but I will stop there on that and move on to work subsequently, many years of work in this sector, um, and uh, with initially with water aid and subsequently with care. And more and more I felt that the invisibilized issues around women's issues uh, continue to be dormant and need much more attention and hence the importance of a forum such as this. Um, just as one example, I went to Nepal as part of a uh, trustee trip with WaterAid last year and there in the western part of Nepal uh, there are culture, there's a culture that means that when women uh, are having their periods they are uh, unclean and therefore uh, they uh, need to stay with the livestock, in a shed with the livestock. So at the one moment when you would expect greater um, hygiene and sanitation needs is the one time that women are in the least hygien hygienic environment. Um, Water aid and many others beside are starting to tackle this issue. So, okay, um, I'm sure most of you are convinced by the importance of looking at women and health and sanitation issues. Um, and actually, that's why you're here in the first place. I'm probably preaching to the converted. But maybe some of you are thinking, so Helen Pankhurst, what's this Pankhurst? Why is she talking about sanitation and hygiene and menstruation? Shouldn't she be talking about political participation and women's votes and all of that? And isn't this a real come down? Pankhurst talking about such things. What would Emmeline and Sylvia be saying? Touch, touch, just not good enough. Um, and yet, no doubt, like all of you, I do believe that women's votes and women's representation is absolutely pivotal to any change and that those are areas that we need to be addressing internationally. Without that, um, you know, nothing will change. Thank you. I also believe, however, in the importance of pragmatic reality of women's daily lives and that unless we do look at the shackles, the daily shackles that women and young girls experience, um, we can't just tackle the political areas. And I also think that equity and inclusion issues are sometimes brought into organisations on the side. So we talk about the general work and then there's a bit of equity and inclusion. And that that's not going to tackle the fundamental problems. Because women's health, as mentioned by Beauvoir at the beginning, um, is about the interplay between biological and sexual differences and gender issues. And that's a political issue. Um, I'm just going to wrap up because I'm almost out of time. And just the last thing that really I'd like to say is that the event today is important in making the practical connection in terms of women's sanitation and health in ways that can improve the services provided. If we listen to acknowledged and research women and health experiences more consistently, surely we could do better than we are at the moment in terms of the services we help provide. However, the neglect of these issues is fundamentally a political one in terms of gender politics. We need to name this for what it is and ensure that work on sanitation and health addresses at its core the political economy underlying social norms and attitudes which perpetuate invisibility and inequality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, for sharing those personal experiences, but bringing it to that political um, level as well. Um, I think that's a fantastic introduction, and we're now going to go into more depth um, on the issue of violence against women and the links that has with sanitation. So I will hand over now to Dr. Laurie Heiss. Um, from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who also is Chief Executive of the STRIVE Consortium. <coughs> uh, 
Great. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I have to admit, I've worked on the issue of violence against women for over 25 years. And it wasn't until last year when I had the privilege of actually joining up with two master's students and helping to supervise them that I began to think about the issues around the links between sanitation and women's vulnerability to violence. And part of what I'm going to share with you today is the research that uh, they pursued uh, in order to try to begin to get a handle on uh, the links that we see between violence and, and lack of opportunities for proper sanitation for women. Um, first off, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that sanitation, even though we don't talk about it very much, is, is actually a human rights issue. It's linked to some very fundamental human rights that we acknowledge and work on, um, including sort of right to dignity, right to health, right to privacy, and right to safety. And I think it's this right to safety issue that we haven't really teased out as much as uh, we probably should have. Um, so what I wanted to share with you today are three studies. One is, was done in Kenya by Amnesty International. And the second two were, as I said, collaborations between WaterAid, uh, SHARE, and students here at the London School of Hygiene doing their master's thesis. Um, all of them dealt with sort of women's perceptions of, of issues of sanitation in a variety of high-density urban settlements, or what was frequently called slums. Um, and one of the overarching findings from these is not surprising, but still sort of important to think about, is that women felt that they themselves suffered a much greater burden from the lack of good sanitation facilities than their male counterparts. I mean, they acknowledge that it was a problem for everyone, but one of the things that comes through the research is the ways in which women really felt that this was a gendered phenomena, and that safety and shame, a really deep, uh, pervasive shame, um, as well as violence and harassment, were the things that came up in, through all three of the research studies. So what I'm actually sharing with you today is, as I said, the, the first is from an Amnesty International report that's available on the web called Insecurity and Indignity. Um, the second two are now published as policy briefs by the SHARE Consortium, and you can also download them, um, and by Karen Massey and Shirley Lennons. So, Going back to sort of the overarching thing that comes out of these studies, I mean, one of the things is, you know, women pointed out, I think, the obvious, which is while men can uh, basically stand up and urinate anywhere they want, um, with very little shame, actually, um, women are forced to use facilities of some sort or open defe uh, defecation. So that right there, there's a built-in sort of biological uh, inequity in terms of the burden of lack of facilities. Um, the women also talked a lot about how because the men left for, to go to work, they were able to, for example, hold it, so to speak. So they could wait until they were out of the shanty town, uh, use facilities outside, use facilities before they came back at night, and therefore were, again, able to somehow, by virtue of their mobility, get around some of the issues. Um, we also heard earlier um, about the issues about menstrual management, and it's another dimension of the lack of sanitation which women have to confront um, every month that is, is you know, not, as, not an issue <laughs> for men. Um, and, and the lack of privacy and the shame associated with that, interestingly enough, even though it shouldn't be a shameful thing, you saw that a lot in the discussions um, and in the, the uh, texts that the women um, uh, used in terms of talking about their experiences. The third thing that really came through is shame related to what the women called home toilets, which was more or less having to defecate in your home. And so using a bag, using a pot. 
something like that. And what they said is that there was a lot of shame associated with that because you're not supposed to dirty or <coughs> sully where you live. Um, and yet, late at night, if you think about it, frequently um, they, they were confronting either taking on that shame or potentially taking on the danger of going to communal toilets. So one of the women, for example, says, well, there are two main difficulties for women when it comes to toilets in our community. The first one is money, and that's another thing that's interesting, is you have to pay for these communal toilets, and women have less access frequently to, to um, income. And the second is that at night, men can easily rape and murder us. So here's a woman from the Nairobi slums. Um, she's saying, over half of us, this is in a focus group, take five to ten minutes to get to the toilet. If you go out at night, you'll get raped and assaulted. For women, this is unique because it's not just the risk of an assault or a mugging, but the sexual violence as well. So this comes from the uh, Amnesty International study. Again, it was a purposeful sample of 130 women from four different slum communities in Nairobi. Um, they were specifically looking for cases of women who had experienced harassment. So about 50% reported um, experiencing some form of sexual harassment or sexual assault. Um, the average distance to toilets in this facility was over 300 meters. And, and the women talked especially about the dangers at night. Frequently, the major coping strategies was this e issue of home toilets, uh, just not using the toilets or trying to get men um, from the family to accompany them at night. And, and one of the things that was interesting, especially for me, who's most, most of my research has been on partner violence, so violence within the family, is despite this incredible risk with sanitation-related uh, issues, the majority of women said that their dominant form of violence in their lives was violence from their partner. And we see this over and over again, where the focus of the international gaze <coughs> on issues, whether it be uh, conflict situations or post-conflict situations, is always on the sexual violence component, which, again, when we're thinking about sanitation, we're thinking about the risk of, of going out into the world. Whereas, while that's, I don't mean to demean that risk or, uh, or say it's, you know, that it's tolerable, it's still not the dominant risk as women um, talk about it in their lives. So, this, this is a woman named Rose. She <coughs> lived in one of these Nairobi slums. And she was, um, she and her family have no toilet or bathroom um, in the plot that they live in. This is where she lives. And you can imagine how difficult it is to na navigate uh, uh, this kind of uh, environment even during the day, much less late at night. She has to walk about 10 minutes to get to the community toilet and pay two Kenyan shillings to use it. Um, this is the community latrine that serves her neighborhood. But she has four children, um, she doesn't have a husband, and her family often can't afford to use these toilets. And at night, she considers it too dangerous. She also risks her health um, trying to navigate or wading through the streams of open sewage that separate her from the community toilets. Lack of waste disposal and formal sewage lines make the road difficult to navigate even in daytime. A second study that was done by one of the master students here uh, uh, the dominant themes that came out in that, and this was in outside of, of Pune in India, uh, was fear, not surprisingly, afraid of harassment and rape when using public to toilets or defecating in the open. Um, there were actual reported incidents that women could name and very specifically. So one of the things that we were trying to get at in this research is, is people often talk about, yes, this happens, yes, this happens, but when you actually try to get them to name specific incidents, it, it's very hard to pin people down. But actually in here, there was a lot of concurrence about specific incidents that women could name. Um, there was also a lot of anger 
that was expressed in the focus groups uh, from women who felt that the police and the community and everything were really letting them down, the government was letting them down, that, that they shouldn't be put into what they saw as a shameful and, and uh, situation and um, felt like that th they were really angry about the lack of attention from government. One of the things that was done as part of this study is, was to actually make a map. The women made a map. This is actually a translated version of that map. Um, but it shows the overall areas of danger and where um, women felt that they were vulnerable. So not the numbers on this map, I don't know if you can see them, but refer to different things that the women said. So for example, number two, which you can, oops, Number two, which you can see over in, on your left, um, says that men shine lights on women when they defecate in the open here, and on other occasions, men hide in the sewers to watch them. One woman, while defecating, was raped and murdered here. Another thing is that having just come back um, from Delhi, it's, it's uh, excuse me, you know, I said this was Pune. This wasn't Pune. This was outside of Delhi. <laughs> um, having just come back from New Delhi, th there's a huge, huge uprising and discourse now going on around rape and, and sexual harassment due to some of the horrific kinds of things that have come out in the news recently. But this was a study that was done by UN Women together with a local NGO called Jaggery, um, just asking women, um, not specifically in just in this settlement, but in this eastern part of Delhi, you know, the percentage that had experienced different forms of harassment and abuse. So here you see, you know, up to 46% of women say that they've experienced stalking, um, 66 verbal abuse, 10% sexual assault. Um, only 10% of the sample had experienced no form of violence. The third study was from Uganda. Um, done by Karen Massey. Again, many, many of the same themes that you see. Few toilets, they're poorly maintained, they're locked at night, uh, they're unaffordable, uh, the safety risk of traveling to them, um, <coughs> and the burden, again, that women felt, oh, I don't know why that happened that way. Uh, didn't do it on top of like that when I did it at home. But anyway, the, the you know, the burden that women felt in terms of it falling disproportionately on them. Um, and they have also felt like they had no choice. They could either experience the shame of using home toilets or the shame of going out into the world um, and the danger thereof. So here uh, is a, a quote from there where they were talking about, in both slums, boys were said to loiter around the toilets at night. In Sundar Nagri, there were cases of boys hiding in the cubicles at night, waiting to rape those who entered. There were also scared of drug addicts who were said to hide in the toilets at night. So this is just the very, very beginning of starting to look at this issue. I mean, actually, when we went into the literature, there's almost nothing on this issue. Um, and I think that there's a potential role for research, both in terms of documenting you know, investigating exposure. Right now, we've only, we don't really have a sense of incidence. We don't really have a sense of prevalence of these, of, of, of this risk in comparison to other risks. Um, we also really have not attempted to measure the effects on women's health or well-being. I think even most, more importantly, though, was the potential of action research and some of the types of things that you can do to try to identify solutions. And in all of the cases, um, they did talk to the women and also talk to local NGOs and Water Aid and other affiliates about what the women felt um, would help. And, and a lot of the times that <coughs> involved getting themselves involved in the sanitation issue. Um, so uh, I think we have a huge task ahead of us, and I'll leave you with that. I do just want to, oops. I just want to acknowledge um, that I'm presenting actually someone else's research, and a special thanks to Oliver Cummings um, from SHARE, who shared some of his slides with me. Thank you.
thank you very much, Lori. Um, yeah, I think that really struck the, the reality of the physical violence that women face, but also the physical and psychological abuse um, associated with stigma that creates this situation where it's culturally acceptable. Um, and the commonalities across countries, I think, just raise this as a real issue that's um, prevalent. So to now look at a, at a different aspect of, of um, our topics linking, making connections this evening, I'm going to hand over to Professor Wendy Graham from the University of Aberdeen, who's going to talk about maternal health. Yes. <laughs> I should stop at just this one slide, but thank you, very, thank you very much for inviting me to speak this evening. Thanks to the organisers. Um, this is a, a great pleasure. I feel in some ways I, I've joined a new family, um, and I'm very pleased to be welcomed into the WASH, the WASH family. And I suppose just to pick up lo what Laurie was saying about 25 years, I've also been working on 25 years around issues of reducing maternal and newborn mortality in low- and middle-income countries, working, working collaboratively. Work in environments where, for example, this district hospital, taken in, a picture taken in West Africa, and once you're alerted to this sort of sign, the hard reality of the frequency of deaths on the maternity ward and on the, the uh, paediatric wards means the mortuary and maternity and paediatrics are often close together. This is the hard reality. The main focus of my work has increasingly been around quality of care, the quality of care, particularly around issues of infection. And it's quite interesting how, again, rather like Laurie is saying, rather late in the day, I've come to make or think about the link with water and sanitation. And I think there is an issue about why do some of these issues that we work on for a very long while, we don't make those connections. And obviously this meeting is trying to make those sorts of connections. But some of us do have, if not blind spots, the way that we work or the fields that we're in mean that we don't necessarily look across. And, and so I, I have a, a similar admission. And so after many years of looking at uh, issues around infection and quality, of care, I've come to this sort of sen a sense of outrage in the 21st century that we still do not have clean, safe birth. It's not rocket science, but that's the topic I want to talk about, clean, safe birth. And it's estimated about 60 million women each year deliver in institutions, so we're, and more of those 60 million deliver in institutions. We're past the tipping point. More than 50% of women across the world deliver in healthcare institutions from very large hospitals to much smaller scale units. What I want to do in this short presentation is talk what, what about behind the doors, and in particular around the water and sanitation, the physical environment in which women are seeking care and the type of care they, might be rece they are receiving. And I've chosen this because I think there is a, one of these blind spots. I think there is a blind spot around quality of care and the physical environment, particularly in the water and sanitation piece. And I think equally when we talk about WASH, I think it's fair to say a lot of that is focused on the community rather than healthcare facilities. So we probably have some assumptions about healthcare facilities that perhaps I'm going to challenge. I think it's important because, of course, maternity services are a very gendered issue uh, for, all, for reasons not just because it affects women, but there are power dynamics, the sort of thing that Helen mentioned, that are very critical and women are particularly vulnerable at the time of delivery. But I actually think, more importantly, there's an opportunity to make a difference. And so some of that difference today in the 21st century is about making connections. So I think it's a real opportunity. Of course, women's health is much more than childbearing, or much more than reproductive health, but some of the issues about quality of care and the safety of the environment in which we seek care apply whether you're going for family planning or whether you're going for chronic care, care for a chronic disease. It's the same thing. Maybe some of the issues around childbirth are most acute. And because I'm talking perhaps to a slightly different family, although I recognise some members here, I'm going to try an experiment. And I'm rather out of my, my familiar territory of graphs and PowerPoint slides. I am going to use slides, but I'm going to just use images. And it's what I call image evidence. And, and myself and a colleague um, uh, who's here, we're, we're, we're starting work around a new initiative called the Soapbox Collaborative, which relies very heavily, <coughs> is building uh, issues up around uh, evi uh, image evidence. So... There's lots of powerful images in this area of pregnancy and childbirth, and here, here is one of them. There's about 134 million births a year, 
thankfully many of them are wanted and many of them thankfully uh, end up with happy healthy mothers and indeed babies but of course behind the positive image there's some other underlying negative issues we still have about a third of a million women each year dying of maternal causes and we still have three million newborn deaths and 2.6 million stillbirths so behind the what can be a very positive event there is still an issue of uh, ad adverse outcomes including mortality but one of the issues is about the preventability and there are figures that we use in this field that talks about 88 to 98 percent of the deaths are preventable in other words we know what to do this is not an area where we don't know what to do in terms of preventing death for mother or newborn and the birth period is the period of birth is a particularly critical time obviously for the baby and for the mother so I guess the question is about place of birth turns out to be very important. It's important in terms of where you deliver and the type of care that you receive. It's really critical to survival and also the issue of the positive experience for mothers. So what is a safe and respectful place to deliver? Well, of course, there are many elements of the place where you deliver. Uh, when we talk about the physical environment, the sort of picture we see here, there's issues of who attends you when you go into a facility and the behaviours of those individuals, the skills that they have, but also the behaviours they practise. And there's a hint at wash in this picture because you can see one of the key things needed for good, safe care is water. And see, you see here, the water supply is important for all sorts of reasons. Not the least is hand washing. And many of us who focus, many of you who focus on hand washing in the community, presume but probably assume that hand washing in facilities happens routinely. <coughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't. And some of it is because of lack of water, although sometimes there are, there are these sorts of solutions when there's not piped water, practical solutions, but also because of behaviour. The sort of behaviour that we know hands don't get washed at at home. So there's a similarity between what happens in the facility and out of the facility. And of course, hygiene and issues around uh, of water are very important to it for infection prevention and control. And IPC, infection prevention and control, is really key in high volume facilities, whether it's in the paediatric area or in the maternity area. Places that have a lot of patients and a lot of turnover have particular issues of infection prevention and control. Do we know about this? I'm st uh, I sort of shiver if I say such a thing sitting in John Snow Lecture Theatre because we've known about these sorts of issues for many, many years. In fact, over 200 years. So here, here is a picture taken in the Glasgow Royal Maternity Hospital. I'll give you a very little bit of history. In about the 1900s, when there was a four times higher risk of dying in the facility than out in the community, and in the facility were mostly richer women. And it's the only time in history when richer women died with greater frequency than poor women. It's the only time. Why? Well, because we had very high levels of infection. The quality of care was partly because we didn't understand the situation, we didn't understand about epidemic purple fever, and mortality was very high. And then from 1935 to 1950, there was an 80% decline in maternal mortality, 80% in 15 years. And if you look at the pattern, a lot of that, the first trigger of the decline was the reduction of sepsis. Women dying of infection was the first thing that changed dramatically. And of course it changed for all sorts of reasons. But quality of care was the umbrella on which, under which many of the changes went ahead. The environment was, was, was changed. The care providers changed so that midwives became very much the centre of attention. And of course there were antibiotics and very scary hair, hairdos. Um, <laughs> of course there were antibiotics. So there was, once you had an infection, a treatment paradigm that could deal with the problem. But actually the reality was it was very much around understanding and practising certainly in terms of the infection control, the importance of poor hygiene. So ending up with what we think today, women-centred care. Women-centred care with the midwife as the lead provider. And some people in the UK would think we've gone backwards in some of our issues around the UK. So one of the things I want us to move on to is to look at to what extent, what is the situation we think about, have any of these practices now been applied in a lower middle income country? And there are all sorts of definitions of clean and safe, the WHO definition which uses six cleans, you know, clean care, clean surface to live on, a sort of sociological view that talks about respectful care, and, a, and the sort of definition that, for example, the London School has been developing, which looks at the availability of water and sanitation in facilities. So what I want to do in my last five minutes is to give you an image storm. Would you wish your relative or your sister or your friend to live, deliver here? Or here? 
And the microbiology from this bed proves that this was a highly uh, unclean environment in which to, which to deliver. One of the problems, of course, is water. It's intermittent, so it's not accessible, it's certainly not available for drinking, but it's also not available for other things to do with keeping the environment clean. Issues of instruments and sterilisation are affected by the availability or not of water. And crucially, it also affects cleaning, a much neglected area. Cleaning, I can't believe after 25 years of looking at obstetric issues, I'm focusing on cleaning. But cleaning is really where there is a major issue. We haven't <coughs> looked at who cleans, how they're trained and what they do. The environments in which cleaners undertake their role in high volume facilities has been completely neglected. And of course, there's also issues of counterfeit bleach, as we see here. So the dilution of the cleaning materials way beyond their effectiveness. And this is what happens. This is a, a sink on a labour ward that the, both the, the nurses have to use, the midwives have to use, but also women if they want to wash their hands. And, and, uh, uh. So this, this is the reality of poor cleaning. So I think one of the issues is, it, and the toilets of course as well, and I apologise, these are images I've taken so I can give permission for them to be used, I understand the circumstances. This is a very poor, I obviously need to link with a photographer. This is the toilet in one maternity unit. This, this is where you have to go if you're in labour, and it's also where the providers go to, to use the toilet. But I guess the question is, it doesn't need to be like this. It can be like this. And I think that's the thing that really strikes me as we go between different areas, is that you can see 200 metres apart or in the same town, a facility providing good, respectful, clean care with the same resource base as some which is providing disrespectful care. And I think that's the issue that we've got to get at. Why is it... It's not just an issue of lack of resources. It is an issue that is very deep, and I think we're, we're not really, ta we're not really uh, understanding well enough. So it can be the sort of environment like this, with good equipment, access to equipment. The sort of, it's not high, particularly high-tech, but it does have uh, equipment that could deal with complications. There are solutions for water, shortage of water supply. There's no doubt about it. It is possible to have a tank like this. And also where there is difficulties and need for greater infection prevention and control, access to gloves, of course. And sinks can indeed look like this. They don't have to look. I mean, these pictures taken in very similar types of environments. Why is it that some are good and some not so good? And the toilets. I mean, these aren't the same toilet cubicle, actually, I have to say. It's the way I've configured the photographs. But it just goes to show, in revised, it is possible to provide a level of sanitation, OK? Some of us would still say this is not uh, as clean as we would wish it to be. But in other words, there are opportunities for change. And this is not all about resources. So I think in terms of change, I think one of the things I would like to see is I would like to see some of the WASH communities that work so well out in the community linking up with issues around in the facilities. There's a great body of experience of communities being very effective. Can we work with those communities, those committees, the WASH committees like here? We need to think about taking women with us, of course. Women understanding about the importance of cleanliness and feeling they have an entitlement to good, clean delivery. And of course there's the providers as well. It's not as if providers wish to work in disgusting environments. Many that are trained in good asepsis then suddenly find they're working in very poor quality environments and there is plenty of evidence to suggest if you put someone in a poor environment, their practice, their standards will go down. Do we ever learn? Do, do we ever learn? So I would like to see more connections, the sort of thing, if you look at, I don't know if you can see in my, I'm not a photographer as you can, as gathered, but if you can see from this picture taken in Bangladesh, groups are working together. We have Water Hate here and Oxfam. We need some more joined up thinking around addressing the uh, issues within healthcare facilities as well. Institutional delivery is on the increase, and so the question is, we need to be prepared. High volume facilities like, for example, this one, are not the type of environments that we should be incentivising or indeed expecting women to go into. We need to prepare ourselves. It's not that we should be discouraging women from going, but we have to get our house in order. Our house in order, and clearly water and sanitation is, is one very key area. This type of situation should simply not exist. I mean, outrage, whatever word you want to use. This is not the sort of place that should exist in the 21st century. It makes a huge difference at all levels in terms of health outcomes, but also disrespectfulness for the provider as well as, as for women. 
So another picture, another picture, these pictures that I take that show mortality next to uh, the maternity, the mortuary next to the maternity ward, they exist in so many places. And this one has the mop in the background. It's a, this is a major referral hospital where this standard infrastructure is extremely poor. And at the top of the picture, it talks about people getting loans to pay for the care. So there are powerful images when you start looking at healthcare infrastructure. I think WASH has been neglected in healthcare facilities, and I think the quality of care teams have rather overlooked or rather forgotten the importance of the physical environment and ensuring it's improved. I think there's a lot of opportunity for direct collaboration between the groups who are already effective in the community around WASH. But of course there is an evidence base still to be built. We still lack some types of data, but particularly we need an evidence base around behaviour change. Why is it and how is it that some places and some individuals rise above the situation of poor resources and provide good clean care? What, it, what, it, what is it about that behaviour change element? So as I said at the beginning, I mean, this is, this, I'm, in a I'm in a different world, well, a slightly different world, as it were, in terms of linking up and creating with others a new charity called the Soapbox Collaborative. We have a very small stand outside. And what this is wanting to do is to address this issue of off-the-radar screen around clean birth, particularly uh, clean birth, uh, of course, clean birth and facilities, and to raise awareness of this is something that we can do about those sorts of pictures I've shown you should not exist in the 21st century. So I very much look forward to making more connections around this theme in the rest of the, uh, this evening's uh, event. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that was um, very compelling images that you shared there and um, just so great to have champions here tonight ready to make those connections. I think um, this is the start of something um, really great. So um, just moving on to our final theme for the presentations, um, you know, menstrual, menstruation is a natural reproductive process essential for life um, but the way that it impacts on the lives of women and girls means that they're not actually able to continue with their lives in a normal way during that time. So to share some stories um, and really bring those issues to life, I'd like to invite Rose George, who um, you may know, but is an author, journalist and sanitation activist. So. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I feel quite junior standing here because I haven't had 25 years of experience <laughs> in, in, well, apart from living. Um, so I, 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 um, my, my story is that I, um, about six years ago, for various reasons, decided to write a book about sanitation. Um, so for the, the subsequent six years have been quite a steep learning curve for me and for my immediate family and friends. Mm -hmm. I think they've just about got used to me talking about shit and poop all the time. Mm -hmm. And now I'm starting to talk about periods. <laughs> so <laughs> my brother keeps sending me tweets saying, do you have to talk about periods again? I say, yes, when you stop talking about cars, I will. <laughs> um, I... Um, came to uh, the topic of menstruation and menstrual hygiene through sanitation and I'm surprised it took me so long. In fact, I, I'm slightly ashamed of myself that it took me a few years. I, I barely mentioned it in my book. Um, I was concentrating on the, the, the terrible statistics around sanitation, um, the death toll from diarrhea, um, and, and I didn't really address it, but I should have done because once you make the connection, it, it's quite obvious. And so I came to it um, last year mostly when I was invited to go and travel around rural India for three weeks with a travelling sanitation carnival. Um, that's the kind of thing that happens to you when you write a book about shit. <laughs> um, and I, it, was, it was a real eye-opener. And I was really struck by what I learned in those um, three weeks um, not least that tents have absolutely no aural privacy whatsoever. Um, I'm starting with a picture which was um, taken in Nepal um, by Alison Shelley, who's done a project on the, uh, for the Pulitzer Center 
for crisis reporting. And this is actually a chalpadi, which is what Helen alluded to at the beginning. Um, this is the family cattle shed, and this is where this young girl has to live for four or five days every month when she has her period. And that's because she's considered unclean and polluting. Um, and I started with this because immediately presumably all of us think, well, that's terrible, that's awful, that's obvious stigma, it's damaging, it's bad, it shouldn't happen. But the thing about menstrual hygiene and poor menstrual hygiene and poor menstrual um, management is that it, the damage is also much more insidious and broader and deeper than, than even, even you'd uh, expect from that picture. So I wrote about this young girl who I met um, in Gwalior in India um, and I'd gone out with the school's outreach team on the Yatra which was the carnival and um, they would go into schools and do menstrual hygiene and, and talk to girls about their experiences and I just sat in on, on various, they were doing surveys as well and this girl really struck me, her name was Neelam and she just sat down and she told her story very simply and her story was that her mother died when she was about five years old probably from breast cancer um, and when Neelam was about 12 she started bleeding and she was horrified she had no idea what this was no one had ever talked to her there was no female relative in her family she spent the whole day in the, in the latrine the family did actually have a latrine quite unusually um, convinced she had cancer, absolutely convinced. Nobody could persuade her otherwise. And then finally her sister-in-law, um, her brother had recently married, her sister-in-law told her that she was menstruating and it was normal. And this was an absolute shock to Neelam. Mean, she had no idea. I mean, I remember when I was 12 and I was at school when I started, that often happens to um, young girls I I in this country and similar countries. And I had to go to the school secretary and I had to ask for a sanitary pad. And of course in those days, in about 1980, early 1980s, it was a brick, but never mind. <laughs> it was very embarrassing to ask for. It wasn't particularly comfortable, but it was there, it was available. And although it was embarrassing, it was there. Now this was a whole level of something else that I was very shocked by. But Neela got her information um, and she subsequently knew what to do. But when we talked to other girls and when um, the MHM lab, which was at the Yatra, which was run by the Collaborative Council, um, which was a tent in the corner of the Yatra, which is a carnival ground, and it was a really, you could always spot it, it was very colourful, um, and you could always spot it because there were lots of boys outside because they weren't allowed in. So they'd all be crowding around wanting to get inside, but you could also spot it for all the women and girls um, waiting outside to go in. Um, and there were things to entice them. There were these wonderful, um, what's the actual name? Uh, menstrual hygiene bracelet. And I believe we have one in the audience. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, so girls could um, make their bracelet and one of the male volunteers um, made mine and he gave me 21 red beads and 4 green beads. So there was some work to be done. But nonetheless, so girls would come in and they would, they would do this and then they would go inside and they would um, um, talk. That's what they did, they would talk. And some of the, um, it, it was revelatory, their experiences. And I'm just going to share some of the um, research that Archana and her team gathered and that was that 70.9 percent of girls had no idea what what was happening to them when they started bleeding. Um, 73 percent of girls and women thought that menstrual blood was dirty blood. Now think about that because if they think it's dirty blood then it means that they think that they're dirty too. And this, they've internalized this and in fact I was just thinking I had a lipstick in my pocket just then and I remember thinking i better take that out because people might think it's a tampon. I mean, it's not just, it's not just a developing country issue. We have internalized and um, stigmatized menstruation to an incredible degree across the world. But of course, in certain areas of the world, it's much more damaging. Inside the tent, um, girls and women could collect these um, uh, cloth sanitary pads which were um, being handed out by these two girls who, uh, this is what happened when I asked them to smile. Um, but the most extraordinary thing about the Yatra was that um, that was the thirst for knowledge and the thirst to talk. You had, on the last day of the Yatra, I remember it was World Toilet Day, and we were in um, a very poor town called Betia in Bihar. Um, <coughs> and we thought, uh, most of us expected that no one would turn up because it was a state holiday. It was described to me as pretty much akin to Christmas. 
So you think the last, people, the last thing people would want to do was come to a sanitation carnival and queue up and talk about um, periods? So this is what happened on Christmas. This is all the girls and women queuing up to come into the Yatra because they were so thirsty for knowledge and information and communication. And I think we've heard that we need more communication, we need to talk more openly about this. Um, I spend a lot of time saying that we need to talk more about poop and shit and toilets and, and I, I didn't realise that this was even a more desperate situation. And um, I think things are really starting to change because there is, uh, Sandy as an outsider, as a, as a outside the development world, as just a, just a journalist and, and a writer, I can see that people are making the connections that people from health and business and education are understanding that 23% of Indian girls drop out of school when they reach puberty basically because they start menstruating and they've been holding it in for years and then when they start menstruating it just gets too much. They think that they smell, they think that they're disgusting, they think they're dirty, they don't go back to school. There are other issues in that the girls are then considered to be sexually available, maybe sent out to do transactional sex to buy money for sanitary pads because nothing else is available. They're, um, as you saw with the child buddy, they'll be subject to various um, restrictions and taboos. A girl told me very, very seriously that she didn't put on nail polish when she had a period because it would go rotten. So this, um, and, and the solution to this I think is very simple, is, that is, is more openness. And that means between sectors, it means between various fields and specialisms in development, but it also means from people like me, and um, from talking about it in the media, from talking about it openly from not worrying whether a lipstick looks like a tampon in your pocket and simple things like that and I think we are at the beginning of really big change and I think it's really exciting and this event is a great start and a spark. Thank you. Okay, thanks Rose. I'm now going to hand over to myself. Um, and. I'm going to, um, this is, as we said at the beginning, this is also an event to launch our resource book, Menstrual Hygiene Matters, and I'm delighted to be here with the co-authors Sue and Sarah um, to be here tonight to do that. And this, um, this publication, um, and we'll have copies downstairs to share and for you to look at, is the output from an ongoing collaboration between WaterAid and SHARE on menstrual hygiene. And we started with a roundtable meeting in 2010 to look at what are some of the knowledge gaps around menstrual hygiene. <laughs> And although we thought that there's definitely a case for more research and evidence, actually a lot of people have been working on menstrual hygiene and there are also a lot of organisations and individuals who've realised its importance and want to do something about it. But the information, particularly practical aspects, is not easily available um, to those who want to take it up. So that's what we set out to address with this. And when Sue and Sarah and I started to cast out the net, we were actually amazed at how much inspirational material and experience was out there scattered across the globe. And this became a very global collaboration very quickly. Um, and we had really amazing inputs from so many people, um, either contributing materials, experiences, uh, reviewing, um, reviewing the resource book, and also we have 17 co-publishers co who came on board. So what we have is a very comprehensive book. Um, it's, it's quite a substantial publication, but it's set out in modules, so you don't have to read it cover to cover. Um, there are nine modules, and the first two consist of introductory information, so the basics about <coughs> menstruation, about menstrual hygiene. Um, menstrual hygiene and health. And the second one is how we can get started on this. Um, what are the interventions that are possible at different levels and by different sectors? And how can we build the competence and confidence of people to actually take up this issue in the first place? We then look at menstrual hygiene interventions and what are the possibilities in different settings. So we look at um, menstrual hygiene in the community, at school, in emergency contexts, working with women and girls in particularly vulnerable situations and research and advocacy on menstrual hygiene. 
And then for each module, there's an accompanying toolkit which has a lot more in-depth information as well, uh, technical designs and so on. So I just want to talk a little bit more in depth on some of the information that's contained in the resource book and that which is particularly relevant to this evening's event. So the challenges um, that you can understand here from the quotes, very um, similar, as you say, common experiences across countries and cultures to those that have already been raised by Rose and others this evening. But I think as well as thinking about the personal experiences of women and girls, these also highlight um, the importance of the issue to us as WASH professionals or to gender, uh, to the gender sector and how it impacts on our work. So the first one again raises the issue Helen mentioned, which is during menstruation, women and girls may not actually use facilities even if they've been provided because of the stigma and taboos around it. And the second one relates to the practice of chapadi, and it, it highlights again the physical and psychological risks um, that women and girls are open to because of the stigma and taboos. These two quotes as well really um, highlight some of the experiences of girls at school and the importance not just of facilities but of having information and support in place um, so that girls um, experience, have a positive experience of school and don't need to, um, don't need to leave during menstruation. Now we also looked at the links between menstrual hygiene and health. And this is something that's often um, cited, but on which there's very little um, evidence, particularly um, the links between menstrual hygiene or poor menstrual hygiene and the risk of infection, reproductive tract infections, <coughs> urinary tract infections. But there is a very plausible link during menstruation that the risk might be higher um, because the, the mucus that covers the cervix um, dissolves during menstruation to allow the blood out. So if women are unable to use clean materials or they're having to reuse materials or they don't know the, the way to use pads, for example, inserting them, then um, the risk of infection could be higher. But as I said, not um, a significant amount of clinical evidence about that. But it's also important that um, women and girls have accurate information, that we have accurate information to provide to them, because actually you find there are myths as well abounding. Um, so, for example, there's, there's a lack of distinction between menstrual disorders and those conditions that could be associated with hygiene behaviours, which means that we may not be giving the correct advice and support to women. And I think it's been made very clear this evening that we're not just talking about physical health, but we're also talking about social and mental well-being. And if we consider health as this broader definition, then certainly the impacts are significant. So what can we do? I mean, as Rose ended on her talk, we have to break this chain of silence. The taboos, which mean that women can't speak out, the gender inequity, which means that they're not involved in decision-making, and the lack of information and awareness both to women and girls and to men and boys and to development professionals mean that there's, there's a lack on both the demand side and the supply side. And this leads to the lack of access to services for menstrual hygiene. So I would, I would concur with Rose, the first step is really breaking the silence and not just encouraging women and, women and girls to talk about this, but also men and boys. And when we've had this sort, of, um, this sort of event, we find men are very willing and interested to talk about this too. So just to set out what we, what we mean by good menstrual hygiene, what that requires... As I said, it's not only about facilities, it's about having appropriate and affordable <coughs> materials, it's about information, and we also need to consider the disposal of materials. And again, as we've seen tonight, there's a role for different sectors to play in this. There are clear links with WASH, clear links with health and education and gender empowerment. And there's also a role for the private sector, both as employers, to ensure that menstrual hygiene facilities are available at work so women can lead healthy and productive lives, um, and also as providers of services. We need to engage with them more. 
But just to talk a little bit more about the social protection se sector, we also really need to think about women and girls in more marginalised and vulnerable circumstances. So if we think about women and girls with disabilities, those with HIV AIDS, um, those who have undergone female genital cutting or fistula, if we think about women and girls in disaster scenarios, um, or those living on the street, then they certainly have additional needs and face additional challenges and require further support. So we need to work together with those agencies who can reach out to them and engage women and girls in those situations as well. So we amassed an, an awful amount of information, but we also noticed that there were some further information gaps, and these are just a few um, that we hope um, work together with us on. But it's actually very encouraging to note that there's so much happening on this now. And I think this quote really just sums up where we want to get to with menstrual hygiene and tackling, tackling this. This is always going to be something that women and girls have to cope with, but we just want to make it the normal part of everyday life, not something that brings everyday life to a standstill. So I'd like to just once again thank everybody who contributed to the resource book. And we do have some copies downstairs on flash drive to share with you, but you can also download it at the WaterAid website and do contact us with um, any thoughts, further information, or let us know what you're doing. Thank you. So, switching back, <laughs> I would now like to invite our panellists to join us at the front. And I'll hand back to Rose, who's now going to take us through the second part of this evening. I know. Deliberate. <laughs> Okay, hello again. Um, so we have a distinguished panel who um, I'm going to invite each of the panel members to introduce themselves succinctly. Uh, and then I'm going to put the, some questions to them and they have three minutes each. No more, please. Um, and then we're going to put the questions to the floor uh, for about 15 minutes. So. Um, we have these two mics, so should we start with Simon? Hello, I'm Simon Bibby, and I'm a Water Sanitation and Hygiene Advisor at D DFID. Hello, everyone. I'm Archana Patkar, and I'm Program Manager, Networking and Knowledge Management, the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council in Geneva. Hello, I'm Sanjay Wijasekra, um, and I'm the Chief of Washet at UNICEF. Hello, good evening. I'm Spera Taire, Head of Program Effectiveness, Water Aid in Uganda. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'm going to put one question to Simon and Archana. Um, you can um, decide amongst yourself who's answering it first. Um, and the question is, the Millennium Development Goals have been successful, more or less, dot, 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 in focusing the international community and national governments to deliver on sector-specific targets. But to some extent, they have also comp compartmentalized issues and sectors and silos. I'll add that bit. As we've heard, the challenges faced by women and girls, from all the presentations we've heard this, are multidimensional and complex and can cross such lines. So, Simon and Archana, reflecting on the presentations and your experience, what opportunities do the current discussions on the post-2015 development agenda provide to promote intersectoral approaches to address gender inequities relating to women's rights, sanitations and health, sanitation and health? Thank you very much. Nice, easy question to start with. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, quite encouraging 
news coming back from Bali and the high level panel there is is obviously very very committed to um, attacking and tackling uh, gender inequities and uh, I think there's a, a very strong desire to uh, to really build on um, MDG3 and to uh, and to really start to ensure that gender equity and empowerment of, of girls and women is a reality so I think uh, what we, the message that's coming through is is very much that there there will be or there will certainly be a lot of pressure to have a standalone goal to to promote that but then all important I think to this discussion is to have that cross-cutting mainstreamed issue of, of making sure that uh, key gender issues are being addressed right across the sector and I think uh, some of the very eloquent images that we've seen there in terms of, of ensuring that uh, uh, wash facilities for example are available in clinics, that wash of facilities are available in schools, that uh, there is the linkage between the community and the schools, that there is the linkage between the community, the schools and the health service centre. Um, I was recently in Sierra Leone where the, the program there actually is run out of, a, of an office that, that links around MDG delivery. So there's actually an attempt to uh, provide services in the different uh, areas and trying to work them together. So that, that is quite encouraging. And I think that from, from certainly from a DFID point of view, that is definitely the way forward is to try and bring a much more um, integrated way of working. It might not be pure integration, but it's more of a convergent cooperation partnership between the different sectors to try and get uh, to build those those synergies as far as possible. So I, I, I personally believe that there is quite a lot of encouraging moves to have uh, gender inequities um, addressed through a much more integrated way of working. But of course, there's lots of different um, elements of the post-2015 agenda which are in um, action as we speak. We've got s the Sustainable Development Goals being developed, we've got the Millennium Development Goals, we've got several different um, fora which are discussing these. So it's going to be quite a challenge to build that consensus and I think uh, there's a, there are people in this room who've got a role in that process and I think we, we urge them to, uh, to take that on and, uh, and, and build the consensus. Um, I think these are really exciting times. Uh, when I think back um, more than 20 years ago, um, and I did dare to talk about menstruation and menstrual hygiene more than 20 years ago, and people would just, whether it was um, in India or Bangladesh or in West Africa, people would just listen with respect um, in other parts of the world, not in India necessarily, and um, just go on with the conversation. Um, you know, and um, in India, people would usually say, oh, there are much more important things for us to worry about. And then, of course, um, talking to wash professionals also very often, um, the, the, the response was, oh, we have such a big job, you know, to even get sanitation on the agenda. Let's not worry about menstruation. And, of course, my response always would be, well, you wouldn't be saying that if you're a woman. If you are a woman and you're saying that, then really, let's think again about what sanitation means. Um, I think it's very exciting to be here but also to hear across the world um, what was a silent stigmatized issue coming to the fore because I do believe and we've heard it um, said many times today that the first step is to break the silence and to break the taboos. Uh, the market will respond automatically like it always does when there's demand but if we don't break the silence and if we don't break the taboos there is no demand and we can't can't continue delivering wash services uh, without listening to the silence demand, making it kind of centre stage, helping it to be articulated. So in terms of the MDGs and looking back, um, yes, they did uh, really help to focus uh, attention on poverty reduction. But by ignoring the social and political stratifiers of inequality and by focusing on the economic uh, stratifiers of inequality, I think they really did women uh, more than anybody else a real disservice, women and girls, because really this um, menstrual uh, hygiene is a fantastic 
example of this, you know, it's a meta indicator that cuts across. Talk about making connections, you know. Um, first of all, uh, let's think across uh, a human life cycle when we talk about delivering services. Services are not about taps or toilets or health clinics. They are about people. Uh, first and foremost, and people, you know, are go through a life cycle: infancy, childhood, puberty, childbirth, old age, and eventually death. And if we really look at this life cycle, it becomes increasingly clear that you can't deliver services in any sector without really keeping human needs center stage, and then that brings about a whole different design, which is not cloned for a certain kind of client or only for disabled people or only for women, but takes note of this life cycle across uh, an entire human being's um, living time and also recognizes that people don't spend their entire lives in the household but really work, play, travel, etc. Um, just seeing what is out there in terms of the technical outputs of the uh, post-2015 process for WASH is wildly exciting for me. Um, I know it's, it's, it's a technical output that will be vetted uh, politically at many levels, but let's not forget that many countries are looking at this now at, in terms of policy and definitely in terms of practice. We have this huge compendium that is a fabulous resource that shows us there are many, many islands of excellence out there. It's for us now to take that together with the movement on the policy front and bring it all together to coalesce really around women's rights. And I can't think of a better meta-indicator for um, equality and gender than menstrual hygiene management across sectors. Thank you, Ajna and Simon. Um, over to Sanjay. So reflecting on the importance of um, addressing these issues in the light of the presentations and your own experience um, of addressing these issues with children and adolescents, boys and girls, um, to address both the practical needs and the stigma, taboos and inequalities. What are successful approaches? What is needed to institutionalize them? Thank you. Thank you. And I noticed Simon got the easy question. Yeah, okay. But first of all, to say thank you very much. Uh, I feel quite privileged um, to be here. Um, and uh, so just thanks to everyone for involved in inviting us. And um, I, ca I can't even pretend to match the, the depth and substance of the presentations were, that were given. Um, but from my perspective, um, just a, a couple of um, maybe just observations. Um, and then if I have time, um, I might be able to say something about um, UNICEF and what we um, what uh, answer actually answer your question. Um, <laughs> but if I don't, you'll have to ask it again. Um, so exactly. Um, the, 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 just a couple of um, uh, the, in terms of the observations that it, it struck me whilst I was listening to the presentations was one. One is. Um, around um, a visit um, I had of w one of the largest um, hygiene programs um, in the world, I guess, the, the Shewa B program in, in Bangladesh uh, with the Bangladesh government. Um, and uh, one of the elements in that is a peri-urban um, element where um, there are adolescent, uh, groups of adolescent girls in, in, in different peri-urban areas who develop um, plans um, if you like, community action plans, but who prioritise plans on what in their communities um, should uh, should improve and c can be changed, and what they can do to 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 make those changes. So these are, you know, very very. Um, uh, it's, I'd say very powerful girls who um, will be very powerful women one day, and and they they're very inspiring. And and one of the things um, that I saw was um, a you know they, they they showed us all of the the mapping of the community and what they had in in store and 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 the timeline and so on, but also um, they showed us. Um, a shop that they had created, and and um, that involved. Um, it was it was it started off mainly around um, making sanitary pads, and and they were doing that. And and who better to design um, and and manufacture these for a market? And and they understand the market really well. So so they did that, and and based on the success of the of that, they expanded it to other hygiene products and and household 
products, uh, including soap and um, toilet cleaner, and, and they, they expanded it. And this was a, th a thriving business in this area. And, and that was, to me, was incredibly inspiring because what, what, it, can, um, what it showed was that, um, you know, that these girls were able to take this with, with very little help and very low unit cost, Simon. I'm you'd be happy to hear. Um, they were able to make transformational change, so not just um, delivering services, but, but actually making it um, much, uh, much wider in terms of empowerment. The second issue was um, I, I was talking to, um, I don't know whether there's anyone from Unilever here, but Unilever very, um, I think in, in a very enlightened manner, support um, our sanitation programming on, on, on community approaches to total sanitation. And I was talking to one of their senior vice presidents, um, Sue Gerard, and she used to, not, not about Unilever, but about her former work in the Department of Social Services. And she was a senior manager in DSS. And most of us, uh, or I did at least, just think DSS just give uh, pensions and, and, and handouts and so on. But what they actually are dealing with is um, long-term and deep poverty in the UK. Um, and we went, uh, we had this conversation about dignity and, and you know, the, the, the kind of benefits of sanitation on both saving lives but also on dignity and how that's very difficult to measure. And what, to cut a long story short, what she told me was that um, dignity or self-respect is one of the biggest indicators of whether somebody who loses a job will actually... Um, get back into the workforce. So it's one of the key things in the UK that you would target in terms of public policy if, if you want to address long-term unemployment. But what amazed me was that um, it is measured um, because obviously if, 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 it's, if, if it's something that's going to be um, addressed, it has to be measured. And so in the, in the UK, um, it is measured. As, as, a, as, a, as a thing, as, a, as an indicator. And that's uh, the dignity piece, I think, is, is something that is really important and that cuts across all of this. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have, we're going to have I'll to leave back to the UNICEF a mystery later. at the moment. Um, sorry to cut you off. Um, last question is to uh, Spera on one end and Wendy at the other. Very good logistics. <laughs> um, I'll start with Spera. So um, the question is, we work with limited resources um, and often in resource poor context, context and we need to make choices on key priorities. What is the key priority? Working collaboratively, however, usually means more complexity and more time. So again, reflecting on the presentations and on your experience, what are the incentives you see in your work for putting in this additional effort? What evidence do we need to convince others that the extra time and complexity is worth the effort. Thank you, Ross, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and uh, share my experience. Uh, I'll start off by mentioning that um, really coming together to address um, some of these issues that are under underlying in our society and that affect WASH and other services that we deliver really by mandate uh, organizations, governments, and uh, multinational organizations are uh, expected to really uh, work on them. And then, of course, the global call to action requires that there is more collaboration and they need to come together and utilize the limited resources uh, to deliver more efficiently. Uh, but most importantly, as we've shared here in the presentations, we realize that a lot of experience exists a lot of uh, solutions ex exist, but maybe making them work uh, in different contexts is what is missing. So organizations need to come together and share these experiences, share the learning. Uh, we have also realized that uh, actually tackling some of these issues and working, uh, uh, coming together as a force really helps to uh, appreciate and understand the underlying causes. Uh, Talking about issues of gender, issues of violence, this has been on uh, long enough, I think, as far as the world started. But the, the challenges are still with us. And so the more need for us to work together. Yes, a lot of effort has been made, a lot of steps have been made, but there's more need to work together. Uh, there's evidence that shows that um, uh, if organizations come together, they are able to uh, 
uh, help, for instance, women uh, take charge of their development. Uh, you realize that, for instance, in developing countries, most of the women are engaged in agriculture. And so if they have access to uh, hygiene and sanitation services, they are able to increase their productivity of their farmland by at least 20 to 30 percent. And eventually that may increase uh, contribution to national uh, uh, growth, maybe to around 4 to 5 percent. But uh, for us to have this evidence and convince different actors, we have to work together, generate the evidence together, and use it to convince uh, the powers that be. Uh, as you are aware, that some of these issues can turn political, both right from the household to the community, to the uh, local government, to the national level. I'll give an example. I think those who have been following closely uh, what has been happening in Uganda. There has been a discussion around the marriage and divorce bill. Uh, but it has been thrown out. It has been in discussion for the last 40 years. Uh, but because it had some contentious issues around poverty, uh, around property rights, around uh, m rights within the marriage, within the home, uh, so uh, they were th the, the bill was thrown out because uh, basically the, 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 the way people believe and think uh, culturally, socially, so uh, they are not able to, to convince uh, that actually this is going to work. So we need a bigger force that will actually help change the attitudes, uh, create the mind shift that we need in order to make progress. And we all know that if women uh, are empowered and are living better lives, then that means we have more retention in school, we have people who are educated and can contribute productively to, to the economy. So I think uh, Really, this is good evidence that we need to work more collaboratively, but we need to break the silence and talk about these issues if we have to make a lot of progress. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, over to Wendy. Thank you very much. Um, yes, the, que the question about incentives to work together. I mean, I mean, at one level, it seems, sort of, seems to me it's sort of what you might call blindingly obvious, I suppose, is that we can't do it alone. And I think it's interesting both Laurie and I had come after years of, of working in a particular field of realising that actually there's a gap and, and that there are others working in parallel tracks. And so I think, I think one of the incentives is, is this sort of self-realisation that you can't do it alone. But I think that comes from where you're trying to go. If you're trying to make a difference, it's thinking about the outcomes that you're trying to impact upon that really encourage you to think about making the collaboration. Um, I think another incentive is, is, is recognizing that solutions will be better, as it were, if you work collaboratively in terms of more creativity, more cross-learning, and I think there's a huge opportunity for more cross-learning between, between areas. To end up with what I might call non-naive interventions, I mean, how many times have we seen all are saying there's no magic bullet, but seeing something being tried as a very naive single intervention that is simply not going to work because it hasn't joined up with the other areas that are necessary, be that behaviour change or be that the environment in which change is necessary. I think there are other incentives, so other areas, uh, incentives in terms of very pragmatic. I mean, we have shortage of resources. We can go further if we pool, and that's both technical resources and financial resources. I mean, I, I know of some great projects where people have got further by pooling, by pooling. So I think there's a real pragmatism involved. And I think, actually, I think at the end of the day, there's also a fun element to it. Uh, when, you, when you're challenged by others that are coming from a different mindset, when they challenge your thinking, uh, they give you also skills. So I think at lots of levels, the four issues, self-realization that you can't do it alone, we end up with better solutions if we collaborate, and that's also something we have to recognise. There's a win-win from linking up um, in terms of sharing resources. And I think we have to recognise the creativity that comes and the fun that can come from collaborating. I guess my last point is I think we need, and as I look at the, the lovely young faces here, I do think we need to think about the role of training institutions, because my sense is, I mean, I'm too late for this, as it were, I've hybridised, I've gone into other areas as I've gone through the career, because opportunities I've been given. We need to create a, a generation of hybrids that move between the spaces of academic research, as it were, and action research, the move between the NGO sector and the academic sector. We need more individuals that enable us to collaborate, because when you get to a certain age, it's much harder. If we build a generation of individuals that move between spaces, I think we're going to be in a better place in a few years' time. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and thank you to all panelists for their um, wonderful contributions. We have, I think, 10 minutes um, for questions. If anybody has any questions, we have some roving microphones. Um, could you please introduce yourselves, and if, if your question is for a particular panelist, do let us know. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Fitzpatrick. I'm a PhD student from Cambridge. Um, I'm not directing this question towards anyone in particular, but a more general question of how do we get boys and men involved? I mean, it's an obvious question, but for any step we make for women in terms of empowering themselves, it could be a, t a step taken back if they encounter boys or men who have myths about menstruation, who have really negative attitudes about menstruation. So how do we engage with them in breaking the silence? Thanks. Okay, well, let's ask the men. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> I'm wearing the bracelet. Yes, part of that is uh, being, being more aware. I think it's. Um, I think it's quite interesting when when I when I look at the sort of indicators that uh, are, are being proposed, um, and I, I think it it sort of really speaks as as to how difficult it is because you know when we're talking about issues around particularly around violence, for example, how do we actually uh, get that message across and, and, and make it unacceptable and and how do we actually uh, first of all do all the promotion work and, 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 and then how do we actually measure that it's that it's happening and I, I think um, I personally have absolutely no experience of this in terms of how you raise awareness around these issues and I think it, it is an incredibly challenging area and uh, I think uh, you know hopefully there are people much cleverer than I am who are working on these aspects of behavior change at schools and clinics and the rest of it and uh, and, and that hopefully we can get these sorts of attitudes across but I, I, th I personally think that uh, it's the it's the reinforcement. I, I, Sanjay mentioned Unilever and and how we're sort of increasingly real, recognizing that we must understand behaviours and why uh, why what are the triggers that that cause different people to behave in different ways. And I think so th th there's a much more sophisticated look at, at behaviour change now. And and I think we're starting to crack that nut. And I think we're recognizing the multiple routes in the, the, the reinforcement and the and trying to use influential figures um, so you know whether it's a pop star or a, or a sports star or whatever to try and set a good example if, if they are setting a good example of course not, not all sports stars do that so I, I think you know it, it is a real challenge and uh, I'm, I'm really sorry that you asked me first because uh, or maybe they're thanking me for, for being so blundering about that but I think it's a really good question Sanjay yes. um, yeah, thanks. Um, just very quickly. I mean, I I don't um, I don't go to church very often, but when I when I do, I I read the book that's in front of me, which which is um, the Bible, and 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 the Old Testament has this thing about, you know, putting women away um, when they're menstruating and and also um, uh, during delivery. Um, and, you know, there might have been, I'm not, you know, setting out to offend anyone, there might have been very good intentions um, and thinking behind that, but translated a um, few couple of thousand years later, um, it's been reinterpreted and misinterpreted. So, um, and that's one example. And, and so, so we're into very, very deep social norms and, and having to establish um, or change social norms. Simon did mention that we, we are actually getting quite good at it and, and we do it in sanitation. We, we, we create a social norm um, across you know, tens of thousands of communities um, for, for people to, to use toilets where they weren't before. Uh, so I think it's no longer kind of woolly, fluffy thing. The positive thing is um, it, it, it can be done. Just, just for my two penneth, um as far as I could tell from the Yatra, the best way to get boys and men interested in menstruation is to tell them they're not allowed to know about it <laughs> and not allowed in the tent. <laughs> no. um, anybody else with a question? Oh, sorry, you've got the microphone. We'll come to you. It's now. actually a comment rather than a question. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, no, thanks very much for the, the brilliant presentations and comments, and it's very exciting to be talking about the linkages and how to engage um, 
men and boys, but also women and girls in these very difficult issues. I just wanted to let everyone be aware of another piece of research that's um, ongoing at the moment relating to gender-based violence and WASH, um, which has followed on from some of the presentations and issues that were found, uh, were presented today. Um, we're trying to develop, um, funded by the Share, uh, the share Consortium, um, being undertaken by WaterAid, um, we're undertaking research um, to try and develop a tool a toolkit for practitioners to try and understand better the linkages between sanitation and, and sanit uh, sorry, sanitation, gender-based violence, sanitation or water sanitation, hygiene, gender-based violence and what we can do better uh, to try and reduce the risks and then also what we can do when um, gender-based violence actually occurs. So we're trying to make linkages with the protection sector um, in the sort of development um, of these guidelines. So if you're interested, there is a handout downstairs, so please um, pick it up. We'll be really uh, happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, just before we come to your question, just uh, Archana would like 10 seconds to introduce another important piece of research. Um, it's just uh, I'm aware that there, there are, we are with a lot of share partners here, and the topic is making connections and share and um, DFID funded chair and also DFID funds us. Um, we've come together to uh, collaborate on a, a piece of research on women and health which looks at four different areas uh, really linked to psychosocial stress. Many of the issues raised today including vulnerability and really uh, increased vulnerability as a result of poor sanitation uh, services but also uh, looking to make the connection and deepen the, Im the evidence on the linkages between uh, MHM and poor infection or poor health and lastly also the links with violence so looking to share that and make the connections even further thank you very much um, this is the, it's going to be the final question as we're a bit out of time okay I'll, I'll keep it very quick then. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask because it seems to me that menstruation what menstruation is is it's part of a cycle it's the fertility cycle and I was just wondering I wanted to ask panelists if they were aware and I don't know how many room in the way that, that a woman from adolescence to the menopause can track her fertility every day and it seems to me that an important part of this whole area is educating boys and girls from their first period to say that this is your fertility you're fertile and there's a global program called Teen Star which does this and the boys, but particularly the women, when they come out of this program, they understand their fertility and they understand every day they can know, am I fertile today or am I not fertile? They say that is empowering. And it has a maturing effect on the boys as well because they realize they don't have a fertility cycle. They're just <laughs> in a straight line. <laughs> and I just wonder, the question is, are panelists aware of this? Because I really think... I, you know, I, I defer to you on hygiene absolutely and all the rest of it, but I'm just wondering if this is something that's come in to all these organisations thinking because I'm, I, I worry that it hasn't. Um, thanks. Um, of course, we couldn't go deep into approaches, etc., but this is an, the way uh, the Council is approaching and many of our partners I know approaching this is as an integral part of the sexual reproductive health um, you know, um, s not just the cycle, but the entire, all the issues linked to it. And the photographs you saw in the Yatra and the tools used, which are very simple. I just want to uh, really point out to the two tools we used. One was for young boys and young girls, a little flip book, which shows how a baby changes for you know for a boy baby and a girl baby and you just open it out um, through puberty and beyond so showing the changes in the body and of course the implications of those changes all the way the second tool was a wheel which I believe is downstairs you can look at it which is again the sexual reproductive health uh, cycle and menstruation and where it fits in there but the issue really was about how do you bring something that is responsible for perpetuating the human race really you know out of the sh out of shame and silence into the um, into a sphere and a space where there is pride okay. sorry 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'd really welcome any any advice. I think from, from my point of view, it's been a really interesting um, opportunity for me to explore areas that I'd, I really hadn't explored before. And I, I mean, uh, on top of the list around menstrual hygiene, you know, there was a, a list of, of various other inequalities and, and, and challenges which are facing women in terms of female and, and infanticide, sexual subjugation, citizens' rights, not having the custody of their children, victims of violence, which we've heard about a lot, their, their rights to travel, access to education, rights to divorce, clothing restrictions, um, and more sort of westernized, forbidden from driving. But you, you've got lots of different examples of this, and I think th that level of awareness giving us some sort of really good um, things that we can start to look at and, and get in there as an, an awareness-raising tool is, is a very useful one. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Very briefly, Sanjay, please, because we are out of time. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Um, just, um, just to say that um, I, I think that's really important, and I think a lot, a lot of the, 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 the progress in terms of um, addressing these issues are around the knowledge piece, and, and um, were, we had a, a, a virtual conference with Columbia University in, in September of last year. Some of you may have taken part in, about 200 people did, where a lot of these lessons um, and were, were, were brought together, um, and, and they're actually have, have just been written up. Um, and it, I, I was just reading through it uh, coming here, um, and, and it's fascinating, and it's from uh, at least 14 countries of both the kind of problems and the attitudes, but also some of the solutions that um, people have um, people have deployed. So from our perspective, um, from UNICEF's perspective, which is also what I was going to say, you know, we're going to invest a lot in the knowledge piece of this, in learning the kind of, uh, both in understanding it, but also learning the kind of approaches that, that work and that deliver results, and also, of course, in, in supporting whatever coalitions of, of action there are um, on these issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm not necessarily aware of that initiative you're talking about, but uh, in our menstrual hygiene work, especially in schools, uh, that is largely emphasized away from the traditional way of taking away girls and uh, maybe working with a, with a uh, head woman or senior woman teacher, but actually discussing menstrual hygiene issues in class and they are part of the curriculum and they have school health clubs where they discuss uh, menstrual hygiene issues openly and uh, also the school administration is, is, uh, is involved and they actually uh, engaging t uh, parents to make sure that they actually provide for their girls uh, with pads. Uh, in some of our urban work in Kampala, uh, the, the requirement is that even boys actually <coughs> contribute pads in school, so they are aware and they know that it is going to contribute to improved uh, uh, sanitation and hygiene in school. So we are integrating all that and uh, it's part of, of the training uh, as part of reproductive health in, in science subjects. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry not to bring you in again, Wendy. Um, thanks for the questions. Thank you to the panelists. And I'm going to hand over now to Helen, who is going to wrap up. So I've got the unenviable task of summarizing all of that as briefly as I can. Um, it seems to me that the first point that's been made is the need to break the silence. That's what we're all here for. It's part of a process, and it's much needed. And the second is talking across differences, across different sectors, across the academic, the policy influence, the implementing organizations. It's talking across the organizations that focus on women and those that focus on adolescent boys and men more generally so that we have that discourse across differences. And then it seems to me that a lot of what we've said is that there are practical solutions, there are obvious things that can be done, there are toolkits, there are guides, there are practical facilities, there are materials. But absolutely pivotal and fundamentally, it's also about tackling norms, political issues, power dim dimensions. And we have to have a language of how to allow that conversation that I started off with to happen. And that will only happen if we, in parallel with doing the practical things, look at the issues that are about voice and about power. Um, it's, it's, and, and, and if we do all of that, we will get transformation. We will get transformational change. One last set of words that I think were used earlier. 
We want non-naive interventions, and non-naive interventions will only be brought about through this kind of hybrid approach, again, using the words that we were mentioned earlier. So thank you very much. I think there's a lot of very powerful things happening here. We need to bring them together and continue the work. So just to close um, this event, I um, would like to invite Eileen, Chief Executive of Share. Thank you, Therese. Well, in bringing this meeting to a short close, uh, on behalf of the Share con uh, Research Consortium, I'd like to thank the, the speakers and the panels who've uh, given us very thought-provoking uh, contributions this evening, but also for starting that discussion. I can't say um, finishing the discussion, but just getting us going with that. So this evening, uh, we've been given an insight into some of the challenges that women and girls are experiencing due to a lack of water, sanitation, and hygiene. But also, we've seen that by working together, we can actually support them in that. So I'd like to bring the meeting to a close, thank all of you for attending, and invite you to uh, join us for drinks and nibbles in, on the lower ground floor, to have a look at some of the maternal health materials that are on display, and to pick up that conversation, make those uh, connections, and uh, to enjoy the rest of your evening here. Thank you very much. <laughs>